Hello, I'm Sherry Sturman, Director of Crayola Education. We're excited that Penguin is collaborating with Crayola on this special Read Along, Draw Along event, honoring Women's History Month. This series helps children enjoy great stories and the illustrations that bring them alive. So get cozy, grab some art supplies, and get ready for this interactive story session. I'm thrilled to introduce New York Times bestselling author, Tracy Boutis. Tracy was formerly an elementary school teacher and now teaches creative writing to students at Lesley University. And I'm excited to introduce our artist and illustrator, Tanya Ingle, who is passionate about helping kids see themselves reflected in the stories they read. Together, they will share their new book, Because Claudette which tells an important story about social justice and a brave teenager who inspires grown-ups to get into good trouble. But first, let's get to know more about our guests. Tracy, you decided to be an author at the age of three when you fell in love with books and knew you wanted to write them. You kept your career plans a secret until you were 13. How did your childhood experiences and your early careers as a second grade teacher and then as a language arts textbook editor influence what you write about? I mean, I had a pretty um, eclectic set of interests as, as a child. Um, in addition to wanting to be a writer, I also wanted to be a ballet dancer. I wanted to be a clothing designer. I wanted to be a lawyer. I mean, you know, I, it definitely ran the gamut before I, you know, finally really settled on, on writing. And then in my life as a second grade teacher, you kind of have to be interested in everything because you're teaching every subject, right? And you get questions from from kids about literally everything. So you, you really have to have your fingers in a lot of different kinds of topics. So I think that has really stayed with me throughout my writing career where I will write, I will write fantasy, I will write contemporary books um, about family. I will write stories about um, incredible people in history, whether they are really famous people or people like Claudette, who has remained a little bit in the shadows of history until recent years. So, you know, it's, it's really that very eclectic interest in a lot of topics, I think, from since I was a kid through teaching, through editing, that um, has kept my writing career um, really interesting and unpredictable. So Tanya, your art has been heavily influenced by the folk artists of the Deep South, as well as the Harlem Renaissance artists and others who have explored personal identity, such as Marc Chagall and Freda Kahlo. Tell us mm -hmm. about your artistic journey and how that led you towards using images to explore personal identity and relationships. You know, I, I grew up in the, in the Southwest here in Texas. Um, we didn't have a lot of money, but I grew up watching my mom make everything around our home with her hands. And she, she did the best that she could in taking us to go to uh, summer workshops where we can get hands-on experience and paint and draw all summer. She took us to community, community centers. She tried to involve us with the community in every possible free art course she could get her hands on. And, um, and one time that we had an opportunity to go to a museum was the first time that I had an exposure to black artists, black art. And I saw Jacob Lawrence for the first time. And I saw, uh, I did see some uh, Mark Chagall, some Frida Kahlo, but more the stuff that really flew off the, the canvas for me was the work that I saw from some of the folk artists, some of the lesser known artists. And they were telling their stories on canvas and or on paper or whatever they could find, washboards, pieces of random wood. I mean the rawness of the materials they were using and the stories they were telling with the most rudimentary designs, but beautiful, vivid color 
was what always stuck with me. And um, I just, my interest just started growing. I would draw all the, the comic book characters that were my favorites. And um, suddenly the people around me became my subjects and my canvases got bigger and bigger and more and more detailed. And I literally was practicing every day on that skill. Later, I was encouraged to, uh, to, to join an art contest in school. And that was the first time that even my teachers got, had a chance to see that I had this certain skill and they began to bolster it as well. I won second place in the, the Texas Livestock Show and Rodeo. And uh, after that, nobody could tell me nothing because <laughs> I was a superstar. You know, I, I had a chance to show this, um, my artistic nature and it was received and it was encouraged. And I think that's the best thing for a young artist. You know, I feel as though my work is still arriving. It's, I'm still learning every single day. And I'm always challenging myself and uh, pushing to go past what I already know and, and to learn more and explore more. What a beautiful message for our, the young artists that are watching to uh, have others encourage them and for them to continue to challenge themselves and stay always open to learning. That's beautiful. I love how this book is full of incredibly important messages about standing up for what's right and the power of one person to spark change. What aspects of Claudette's story do you think are most important for students to know about? In reading about Claudette's story and understanding what it was that motivated her that first time that she decided that she, she was not gonna get up and give up her seat on the bus was that she had literally just come from what used to be called Black History Week and was learning about various heroes, uh, uh, Black American heroes who had done incredible things. And so the power of that history that she had just learned really empowered her to be able to do what she did. And that is exactly what kids need to be able to be bolstered in their actions of right now, because that is what Claudette relied on. She relied on that history to be able to do what she did. And so we really need to understand our history. We really need to know what it is to look at patterns in history, to look at people, ordinary people who did extraordinary things and understand that there were a lot of ordinary people doing extraordinary things throughout history so that kids know that they can do literally anything that they want to do. They can stand up for things that they believe in because people have done it before them. Building on your comment about the importance of history to inspire youth, you refer to Claudette Colvin as a living legend. And children might be thinking of this story about segregation and restrictions on where people could sit on a bus as long ago. And you know, not, not really today. They might not realize that this brave young girl is still living. She's still alive today. So tell us more about this retired civil rights activist, a former nursing aide, uh, and the re recognition that she's received as this early soldier in the fight for civil rights, someone who is still with us today. It's really incredible looking at her story and the trajectory of her participation in the civil rights movement, movement and in activism. She was a nurse's aide for, for many years and she only recently retired. So two years ago, I went to her retirement party in the Bronx, uh, which is right near where I live. I literally drove like 20 or 30 minutes over there to, um, to be part of her retirement party. And there were so many people there, her kids, her grandkids, and kids need to know that this is somebody who is you know, maybe about their grandmother's age, grand, grandparents' age. They are not that much, they're, you know, like they're not in history. They are very much in the present. And Miss Colvin is very much 
active still in justice movements and also in making sure that history is told and history is told correctly. One of the things that she did recently was to have her, she, so she was arrested when she um, refused to give up her bus seat. And she recently had um, that case thrown out. Like it was, it was still on her record. She still had a criminal record. So she had that cleared. Only recently she, she did that because of course it was not the right thing to have arrested her for, for something like that. It was in fact the law at the time, but because we now realize that it was an unjust law, she had that unjust law um, just cleared off the books just recently, really just, I think it was in either November or December of last year. So not too long ago. So these are things that are still ongoing that people are still dealing with right now. It is not long ago history. It is very much right now history. Before you read the book, please explain to the vocabulary to, uh, to some of our young viewers who might not know what the word boycott means and why a decision by the Alabama Supreme Court was so important. A boycott basically is when you say that you will not support a particular um, entity or a particular business because you disagree with something that they are doing. So for example, if let's say your local ice cream parlor um, decided that they were no longer gonna let kids ride up with their bikes um, to order their ice creams, and you may think that that is unfair for whatever reason, um, maybe, you know, because you feel like that's the only way that kids can transport themselves to be able to get their ice cream, you know, whatever the reason is, um, you may say that, well, you know, until you change this particular unfair to us practice, we are not going to come and buy your ice cream. We're going to go someplace else. And that is a boycott. And what that does, it is affects the business financially. So because they are not making money from, because of the boycott, they may feel some pressure to change what it is they're doing. So that's, that's what a boycott is and that's why a boycott works. And as for the Supreme Court, so you probably understand that there are courts when somebody does a crime or there's some kind of criminal activity, there's a particular procedure you may be arrested, you may be charged with a crime, and then you have to show up at a courtroom where a judge will make a decision about whether or not your behavior was justified or whether your behavior was incorrect as far as the law is concerned. And then the judge will decide, okay, well, because of this, we may give you a fine of you know, a few hundred dollars, or you may have to go to jail, or you may have to do community service or things like that. Well, if you, if that judgment comes down and um, you disagree with the judgment, you can take it up to the next court. So there are higher and higher courts. There are steps, of course. And the highest court in any state is the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court's, and that's why they're called Supreme, and the Supreme Court's decision is final. Um, so if you go through all the steps and you go through the entire court system, when you get to the Supreme Court, whatever the Supreme Court says, that is the final, final decision. There's no more going back and forth trying to change the outcome. There's nothing like that. That's why the Supreme Court is so, so, so important because their decision is the law. Thank you for explaining that. I think it's going to make a lot more sense when um, our, our listeners get to hear the story. In fact, we are so excited to hear the story of this brave young girl's fight against injustice. Please now read Because Claudette. Here we are. Here is the beautiful cover by Tanya Angel. Um, I love Claudette wearing this beautiful pink sweater. Here we go, Because Claudette. Oh, I have to show, of course, the title page. Of course, here we go. There she is, getting on the bus. 
because 15 year old Claudette Colvin didn't give up her seat on the bus for a white person on March 2nd, 1955, she was arrested. Because she was arrested, her parents asked a lawyer named Fred Gray for help. Mr. Gray wanted to know more about Claudette, so he asked fellow activist Rosa Parks to meet with her. Because Mrs. Parks was a member of the civil rights group, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP, she invited Claudette to one of their youth meetings. Claudette liked the meetings and kept going. Some nights, the meetings ran late. When that happened, Claudette stayed at Mrs. Parks' home. Claudette chatted while Mrs. Parks sewed and the two became friends. This was a good thing because Claudette's classmates were upset with her for causing trouble and Claudette found herself more and more alone. But Claudette wasn't alone. Because she had studied Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass at school, she learned how they worked hard and caused trouble so Black people would be treated fairly. That year, Aurelia Browder, Mary Louise Smith, Susie McDonald, and Rosa Parks also caused trouble when they said no to giving up their bus seats. Because of them, Claudette truly wasn't alone. People had enough of the unfair bus laws, so many came to Montgomery, Alabama to talk about what they could do. Because the meetings were organized by churches, many preachers came too. One was a relatively unknown young preacher named Martin Luther King Jr. Because Dr. King was an electric speaker, he got people excited to take action. They decided on a bus boycott. Professor Joanne Robinson was ready to organize it. A year before, she had tried and failed to get W.A. Gale, the mayor of Montgomery, to change the bus law. Because churches could pass out flyers on Sunday, the boycott was planned for Monday, December 5th. When the boycott began, many people needed to travel far, so car rides were arranged. Because there were not enough cars for everyone, a lot of people walked. As shoes got worn down, people all over the country sent donations. Because Mayor Gale still refused to change the law, Fred Gray challenged it in court. Because Claudette was impressive and engaging, Mr. Gray asked her to be the final witness on the stand. Claudette was so convincing, the judges ordered a change to the bus law. When the city and the state refused to follow the court's orders, the boycott went on for many more months. The case then went to the Alabama Supreme Court. Those judges agreed the bus laws needed to be changed. Mayor Gale challenged the ruling again, but the court forced him to comply. Because of that, on December 20th, 1956, the bus boycott ended. Claudette learned about this, like most other people, from reading the morning newspaper. On December 21st, 1956, anyone could sit wherever they liked on the bus. And all of it happened because of Claudette.
Wow, Tracy, that was so powerful. I love your description of Claudette in the courtroom that she was convincing and impressive. It's so important for everyone to know her story. You know, many students learn about other important figures in history, such as Rosa Parks, but many didn't realize that it was this 15 year old teenager who inspired Rosa to give up, to, to refuse to give up her seat nine months after Claudette uh, was arrested for this. So really such an important story. So your illustrations in this book give the reader a really, uh, a realistic look at what life was like in the 1950s. And I'd like us to look closely at one of your opening illustrations where Claudette refuses to give up her seat. Tell us about the intentional decisions that you made that show the bus driver's finger pointing at her and his eyes and his face at the top of his head are off the page while you're painting Claudette so calm and determined as she's glancing out the window instead of looking back at him uh, with intimidation. So the decisions, talk to us about the decisions that you made as an artist to show the readers the emotions and the sense of power in the scene. When I thought about um, the scene, I just knew that there had to be an extreme amount of tension. I knew that her expression needed to be a little bit on the edge of stoic, but, but hurt, as you can see a little bit of pain in her face. There's a, a whole melange of expressions on that one face in this particular scene, and it's, it speaks volumes. Um, the wonderful thing about art is that you can tell an entire story with one single expression. Um, but I also really wanted the scene to be very realistic because I wanted you as the viewer to be transported to that very moment and for you to be pulled into the emotion of that of that setting as well. And in fact, the sign as well is actually from a historical reference. Everything, everything about this piece is actually what the bus's interior looked like. So as far as Claudia, uh, Claudette goes, um, I really just wanted to show her, you know, this child mustering up this strength from who knows where and, and being strong enough to and brave enough to just hold her ground, even though there's this ministering figure who's symbolic of all of the all of the oppression that people were receiving, all of the the uh, negativity and anger was all sort of balled up into that moment when he said, "Get to the back of that bus." And I just wanted to show, um, I wanted to show the the you know the expression. The fact that she's leaning away from him um, is, is, is showing that she's finding, she's building up strength and she's turning her back to the symbolism that he represents. Love the way you described the intentional emotional expressions you showed and the history that, that really documents that era, so important. There's another illustration that we'd love for you to talk with us about. Here you painted a classroom scene that many of our viewers might be able to relate to uh, because Claudette is feeling really alone. We see the paper airplanes being tossed at her head and kids behind her giggling. Uh, it looks like they're making fun of her. Today, we call this bullying, um, but the social and emotional story is really the same. So how did you design this art so that the readers got the sense of being alone even when surrounded by others? This page is very important because it, it symbolizes how lonely standing up for yourself can be. You have a, a perspective that's different than everyone else's perhaps, or when you stand apart in some way, maybe people don't necessarily agree or they feel like you're making waves. They're not realizing the greater good that she's doing in the moment because they feel as though she's just making waves and causing trouble for, for black folks during that time. And during that time, People were expected to just be quiet and stand back and just go with everything, you know. And she, in saying, no, I don't want that anymore. I want to make a change. It was more than just her being personally brave. It was her being brave for her fellow citizens as well. 
if anyone out there has ever been bullied, it's really, really difficult thing to even just show up at school. And the fact that she even showed up every day when she was receiving um, so much uh, negative energy from all sides showed another layer of her braveness, you know, of her courage. You know, I say to people who who are out there, do you, <laughs> don't worry about everyone else and what everyone else is doing, because at the end of the day, they're going to remember this brave girl who, or brave boy, whoever you are, they're going to remember you for standing up for what you believe in and who you are. It's beautiful. It has been great hearing you describe those illustrations. And now we're excited to have you demonstrate <laughs> the art and to have the draw along portion where our viewers bring their art supplies out and do two uh, art experiences with you. As we saw in the opening illustration, facial expressions and body posture can speak as loudly as words. So Tanya, we would love for you to demonstrate how our young artists can draw their own face, uh, their portrait, showing themselves being very determined, very proud, uh, similar to the look that you gave Claudette in that opening scene where she tilts her head and she has a calm gaze that's looking away. But there's so many ways that we can look proud and determined. So to start off, almost every time I, I begin a sketch, I use a brown toned pencil. Um, it can be brown or it can be sort of a dark yellow or an orange color. In this case, I'm gonna use a sort of a, a combination of the two. I'm drawing Claudette, but I'd like for you to draw yourself. When you're creating faces, it's a series of circles. So I'm gonna draw the circle of the back of her head and the bottom of her head, which is kind of an egg shape and the tilt of her neck, okay? and shoulder. She's kind of leaning off to the side. So her face slopes to the side. And so she's got these glasses. Those glasses almost divide her face in half. Okay, I'm still using the brown pencil and I'm just sort of outlining where I want my colors and details to go. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to color. All right, so what I want you to do with this next is to put on your base Skin color. What color is your skin? Here, I'm going to put in her eyes right now. Um, typically, when I sketch, I work really quickly. Okay, let's get you with her glasses. Actually, I'm going to put her glasses on last because I feel like uh, she is going to, it's going to blur if I attempt to do it first. I'm showing the shading underneath her chin, underneath her nose. A little bit of shading underneath her glasses. Her hair, I'm gonna go ahead and put that hair in there. Now, um, hair shines. I like to show the texture of hair by leaving the spaces where the shine is empty. And in her case, she's, her hair is glossy. She's sitting right next to the window. There we go. And so get her lips. Her lips are just a little bit pinker. Let's see there. The same thing goes with lips and, and pretty much all of the skin. There's always some sort of a glisten where the sun is touching the skin. So you, I always try to demonstrate that by leaving those areas blank. All right, we're getting, the glasses are a statement. Um, oh, these are metallic. Oh my goodness, these are the best. I wish that I had these Crayola colors when I was a kid. <laughs> I didn't even know they, they invented a metallic marker. So I'm drawing Claudette. I hope that you guys are drawing yourselves and you're getting a, you're putting your personality into it. You're, you're showing what kind of clothes you might actually like to wear and you know what your real expression might look like if someone were treating you that way. Oh, I found the perfect shade. There. Again, I leave spaces, white spaces for where 
I think the light might hit her face. Now for her jacket, I really loved researching her clothing during this time. And I found that she really liked to wear pink. And I just thought I'd highlight that in this book. And this pink jacket is really something. It's got this wonderful striations and texture. It's definitely something of the 1950s. The wonderful thing about sketches also is they don't have to be perfect. You can always come back and after drawing the highlights of the details and fill in and change things and alter them um, as you wish. And over the pink, I'm just going to sort of blend it with another lighter shade of pink. So determined. Okay. Wow, Thank you just get this that. sense of strength and pride. Absolutely. Fantastic. So let's transition now to the second art demo where we're going to draw uh, a map to the heart, all right? So the center of your artwork will be a portrait uh, either of Claudette or of yourself. And then what's, what's the map to your heart? What are the things that you love? So what we're going to do now that we have the center part is we are gonna make you the center of a map. What I mean is we are sort of examining or uh, understanding who you are. So if I were gonna find the way to your heart, what is the road that would lead me there? So ask yourself, what sort of things do you like? Do you like, me personally, I love pizza. So um, I'm gonna draw pizza here. I know it sounds funny, but I just, I love pizza. So I'm drawing a pizza here. What do you like? What do you enjoy doing? If you were gonna to travel to my heart, how would you get there? Would you go by bicycle? Do you enjoy biking? I absolutely do. I hope you can see that. So I'm gonna draw a bicycle. I love biking in this, uh, when the weather is nice with my daughter. We just love sightseeing on our bikes. So, boop, 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 boop. we're gonna draw the road to, to you. What sort of things make you upset? Does it really make you upset to see someone you like or someone you know, or even someone you don't know being bullied? You know, and what would you do if you saw someone being bullied? Would you talk to your favorite teacher or your principal. I'm gonna draw my favorite principal in high school. He used to always wear Mr. Papa Constantino. He used to always wear blue. And he was such a kind person. And if anybody was ever bullied, he would definitely make sure to handle it. And there were a couple of times when I was bullied and he sat down with us and he made sure everything was okay with all the parents and we were all good at the end. So Mr. Papa. I'm using blues and reds because I remember his red tie. What does your, what is your favorite person that you would go to if you were in trouble? What do they wear? Is it your mom? Is it your dad? <laughs> Mr. Papa didn't have much hair. <laughs> Just remember kind eyes and big eyebrows. <laughs> Here's the map. I'm gonna draw my favorite dog, Pablo. With the, that, it's always the tongue first. <laughs> He was definitely a, a drooler. <laughs> Can I see the black marker, too? 
He's just big old happy dog. Pablo. Let's see if I can get some more colors on Pablo. Pablo had brown and black dots, so let's see if I can get that happening. And a pink, always wet nose. <laughs> Just draw one more thing that would be near and dear to your heart, and that would be something that you couldn't do without in your life. I think for me that that is my daughter, Zoe. Zoe's got long braids. And the cutest little apple cheeks. Apple cheeks are just round cheeks. What shirt are you going to be wearing? Hello, kitty. Hello, kitty. Okay. The mat to your heart. There's Zoe. Come on over here. <laughs> I forgot to go up to put her glasses on her. That's Zoe. Hi. And our bicycles, I should have drawn two. Pizza, unfinished. You guys might not be able to finish it during the demonstration, but you can finish later. My favorite principal of all time, Pablo. My favorite dog of all time. Now that you've seen Tanya's wonderful illustrations, it's your turn to draw. Grab some crayons, markers, and paper, and think about stories of change and standing up for what you believe in and how those stories can be told through art. You can draw yourself being very determined and proud and map a place that helps people find your heart and what's really inside of you. After this session, you'll have plenty of time to finish your art. And when young artists finish their work, we recommend a dis discussion. Talk about what they created, what inspired them, and then post a photo of their art in the comment section of this video. We can't wait to see what they create. And while Tanya and kids of all ages are busy with their drawings, I wanna to mention to parents and teachers that you can sign up to receive free monthly resources that make learning colorful and fun. And they're delivered right to your email box. Tanya, your art inspires us all to be brave and to stand up for what's right. Before we close the program, what last comments would you like to share with our viewers to help them feel the power of artivism, that blend of art and activism? I have found a lot of self-empowerment through my art because it's, you know, art is a wonderful thing. Art can give you a voice. If you are quiet, if you're shy, you can express yourself through art, but also it's meditational, it's calming. And not only that, it can, it can send messages to others, uh, you know, messages of hope, love. Uh, art inspired me to be brave as a shy young girl because I, you know, I felt as though even if I didn't have all of the right words sometimes, I felt like I could express myself through art. And I think that's the wonderful thing about art. Tracy, throughout this book, we see how someone who is so young can transform history. And it's really empowering to know that this story um, that often hadn't been taught, that this teenager had worked alongside Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks. And she really left such an important uh, difference in the world. Before we close, what last advice do you want to share with our young viewers that might encourage them to speak up for what is right? That is a great question. And before I go, I want to uh, thank you and thank Crayola again for, for having us and, uh, and doing this one and spotlighting uh, Claudia Colvin.
The thing that I would want kids to remember from um, Claudette's story is that she didn't know when she did what she did that this was going to spark a huge moment in the civil rights movement. And you cannot ever really know exactly what your efforts and your actions are going to do and how they are going to affect the world or people around you. You just do the thing that you know is right in the moment and then see where it leads. And sometimes it'll lead to one person feeling better and feeling good because you did something. It might lead to a small group of people um, you know, being happier or having a better day because of something that you did, or it might lead to a huge movement. You know, your small action of kindness and your small action of standing up for what's right is just as important as anybody else's action because you have no idea where it could lead. Look at what Claudette did and how that affected all of the pieces that came together to make this huge movement um, work. And if she hadn't done that, the rest of it might not have fallen into place. And she may have thought it was just one thing that she was doing, something that she was just doing for herself, but it turned out to be something that she was doing for so many more people. So don't be afraid to make your small action, make your small stand, do the thing that you feel is the right thing to do. Such an empowering message for our young viewers. We want to thank Tracy Boutis and Tanya Engel for inspiring us today. We also want to thank Penguin Kids and Penguin Classen for bringing this wonderful book to the Read Along Draw Along program. And a special thanks for all of our viewers who are joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Crayola. Thanks everyone for having us. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.